Welcome on this the day the Lord has made. We are so excited to have um, Pastor Jacob here with us today and week two of our Linton series. Uh, we started last week with Captain Tui, who introduced us to different personality types of the Enneagram and how we all uh, experience the world a little bit differently. And uh, we're going to continue on with that series today, talking about nature and um, how nature informs our well-being. Um, I am going to get started in just a moment with prayer. I am trying to think to make sure I don't have any announcements. Is there anything that needs to be announced this morning, do you know? an hour of sleep next week. That's about all I got. an hour of sleep <laughs> next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Days are longer. That I prefer to have. There we go. Right. right. I, uh, I got to spend uh, a considerable amount of time outside playing in my garden yesterday. And I was very excited. Yay. So, yeah. um, what excellent preparation for this morning. It, that's what I was thinking, honestly. <laughs> yeah. That was, was the whole part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, with that, let us start with a word of prayer. God, who makes all things good, we invite you into the space and into our hearts. Fill us with your love and compassion, the love you have for us, the love you have for all people, the love you have for your creation that you made and called good. In the name of the Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 I went for a bike ride yesterday to prepare for this class. It was such a great day at the outside. Um, Earth and all stars, bright shining planets, sing to the Lord a new song. My name is Jacob Bolton. I'm the Associate Pastor of Formation here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. And to follow up from Catherine Tui's fantastic class last Sunday, I am an Enneagram number. Anyone want to guess? Uh, nine. nine. I'm a nine. Oh. Yep. Uh, any other nines out there? No, I'm a seven. I'll tell you what a nine is. Fear not. I'm it's coming. Eight. You're an eight. Who's a seven? Yeah. Okay. Uh, divine nines. Yeah. <laughs> a nine is someone called a peacemaker. Yes. Nines often make good mediators because they can naturally see all sides of an issue. And that usually helps motivate others to reduce conflict and create harmony. They're often affable and easygoing and focus their attention on simply getting along with other people. They're relatively chill individuals. <laughs> now the downside of that is that nines tend to be a tad out of touch with their own anger or their own personal or professional agendas. Because having strong opinions on issues might upset that delicate harmony or invite conflict with others. Nines often have a hard time saying no or taking a stand for themselves or their loved ones or even uh, because that's often unintentionally or even unconsciously a mode for them to be passive aggressive. Some famous nines happen to be Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. Aubrey Hepburn, James Taylor, All right. <laughs> Carolina on my mind, yes. <laughs> and I, I tried to learn that on guitar for this class. I saved everyone. <laughs> uh, save us from your anger, it might be coming out. <laughs> Fred Rogers, yeah. Whoopi Goldberg, <laughs> And uh, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh is a nine. So as we get settled in, I want to ask us all a favor. Uh, and please gather with your neighbors. We can do a little movement around here. And discuss one time when you experienced awe or when you experienced wonder in nature. We're going to have a few minutes. Please feel free to move around, but what is a time when you experienced awe or wonder in nature? We're going to be as unpresbyterian as we can here. We're going to share, right? <laughs> so please talk amongst yourselves. I'll walk around. I want to hear some of these. 
we can do that. Maybe one or two more minutes, everyone, but this is fantastic. I love what I'm already hearing. Thank you. Thank you.
just the beauty of it. You know, and it's just like It's like seeing love making connections and bringing people to the relationship. It might just be the thing for them. I think that's it so much because it might be just be the thing. All right, everyone, I am sorry to have, you know, primed the pump like that and then tell everyone to slow down and then to, you know, stop sharing at your tables. But I am going to ask if anyone has a few things, maybe an example, something from your table, either yours or someone else's moment that they would like to share with the whole group collectively. Uh, there is no pressure. However, uh, it would be great fun if we could hear maybe one or two or three. Um, from all of us. And please. Um, I was telling them that um, last summer in June, I went back to Glacier National Park where I'd worked during the summer between my sophomore and junior year of college and with friends. And we went up to Canada. It was nice enough to see Glacier National Park. So yeah. we went up to Canada and went to Lake Louise which if you've never been there is amazing. It's so beautiful, the water color, it's glacial. So it's that blue green. And then uh, to Banff uh, Springs and went up on top of the mountain, looked down on the Bow River Valley and it was beautiful. And just a, a word about a friend of mine who uh, Beth Norcross operates a nonprofit called the Center for Spirituality and Nature. That's her website. So people that are really interested in, you know, the natural world and going on hikes in nature, Beth leads those and stuff. The Center for Spirituality and Nature. So just great shout out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any others? John, yes, please. I was in uh, synagogue in Greenville, and I had never seen. I did not know. Cashew growing on a tree. Of course, they, they are a beautiful, they have a beautiful red fruit bite. So the cashew itself just comes out of it. But we're riding through this cashew tree orchard, and the village that's next to it. And I was just really taken by the fact that all of it is something like. Uh, National Geographic, it, it backs through trees. It can have no, no indoor plumbing, no electricity, dirt floors. And it, uh, they're making money selling cashews. They don't have enough. Let's make sure it's more cheap people live in other. Yeah. Prue, you, you gave a great example that was much more local than Senegal or Glacier National Park. <laughs> May you please share what you told me just a second ago? Yeah. Well, uh, I used to live at 282, and then if you know, last year they made me move because they couldn't put in stainless steel appliances and everything. So when I lived at 282, we had a view of the pool, great myrtles and flowers and plants. And in the distance, you could see a split in the trees in the distance, and there would be uh, turkeys, turkey hawks, and uh, hawk, regular hawks mm -hmm. and flying around. <coughs> it was just beautiful looking out the balcony window at it all the time. That was it. Thank you. And one time we lived in Boulder Creek, California, when I was little, and the creek was just coming down through the redwoods and all, mm -hmm. and uh, they had crawfish in it. My father decided to build a dam there so we could have some place to wade. So we could wait for the top of the creek that had stones in it this big around solid white. I don't know where they came from or anything, mm -hmm. but that's why it's called Old Creek. Mm -hmm. Love that. Any others? Thank you, everyone. Sure, thank you. Um, I was, I work for the State Department. I was in Zimbabwe um, just for a, a short visit. And 
with the limits because um, we were staying in, uh, we have to stay at nice places when we go there, <laughs> to places there just for our own safety. So we were staying at a um, basically a, a little resort and they had little cabins, like a cabin on the couch, and the grounds were just amazingly landscaped with ponds and little hills and little paths and outdoor spaces um, covered in banana. Um, it, it was really beautiful and in a very poor place. Um, but we arrived during the day, checked in, and then went to the embassy to work. And then came back, and, and I was like stunned at how beautiful this little resort was. But you know, it was walled and guarded. And there was like a, a feeling of edginess. Um, and, and then we came back, it was nighttime. And, and then we all went to our, our, our little cabins. And what I didn't anticipate was the volume of the frogs and the whatever these things, I don't even know what these things were, but it was just this cacophony yeah. that was sort of beautiful in a, in a, in a natural way. Um, because of all of the landscaping and the ponds and, and the trees, um, it was more than just a visual experience. And I walked around the grounds and just, I recorded it actually, Zimbabwe at night. Wow. Oh. It, it was really amazing. Awe through this, through the sounds. That's, that, yeah. that's, that's, I love that. It's not just visual or like being in a space. Because it was nighttime, so I couldn't that's see sweet. the landscaping as much. There was really nice lighting, yeah. but it was more of a, you know, floral sound. Thank you. But, Prue, I want to go to you, but I, I want to respond to that. I have a friend who um, uh, is a Cornell and a National Geographic scholar. And he goes around the world and he intentionally does something like that. He records the sounds of these different animals at night or during the day, insects, birds, frogs, you name it. And he is also a very skilled beatboxer. Ah. And what, uh, anyway, who wants to give an example of beatboxing? <laughs> you got this. No, I don't. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, now I'm gonna dance for everybody. Um, and what he does is he mixes that. And so he will beatbox. And then he'll loop that and then he'll in and then he'll you know through his technology tie in the recordings of these other animals yeah. and, and 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 that, that that's his research i mean like he's he's on national geographic tv to do this um in another setting i invited him to preach at a church i once said wouldn't happen here but um <laughs> Um, um, amazing guy amazing guy right and so anyway I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up so thank you for raising the sound yeah, yeah, of being in awe that's that's beautiful yeah. uh Prue, one one final one for you. yeah okay uh and since we live in california and I, my sister and i used to roll down these hills we used to do it and uh it was great fun but we had a constant case of poison ivy we used to go on it <laughs> that year we lived there. But then we moved to what Eastern Washington State, uh -huh. the Richland area, and it's all sagebrush and dry. Oh, and when you move from something like the redwoods to that, you have yeah. to learn to appreciate nature all over again. Yeah, that's and, right. And, and For sure. Know, you can't learn to appreciate nature in its the way it is wherever you go. That's true. That's true. I, I was looking at my phone. And when we, uh, and you know, just the image that pops up from six years ago. And six years ago today, my son and I were shoveling our driveway in New York because there had been a whole lot of snow. <laughs> just to prove that, you know, I mean, we didn't move that far, but not nearly as much snow here often as there is in New York, you know, let alone flora and fauna. So thank you. In the lake effect? Not where, not, not where, I mean, we were in New York City and Westchester. We were in Buffalo. You know, I got a lot of lake effect growing up in Michigan, though. That's for sure. That was my nine months out of the year was lake effects. I think that one of Dana, the please. things, though, that that we're all talking about or bringing yeah. up in differences, which are the things that make us find awe 
Yeah. Right. Because it's not what we see necessarily on a daily basis, although we can appreciate what we see. But I think um, when Prue said, and I had to learn to appreciate yeah. the different way that I think, you know, you know, if you live someplace, you know, the subtleties of all the parts of the nature. So you see, oh, the mm -hmm. burgeoning of this or the that or the fullness of that. And if you're just coming in, you're just going to notice the differences. Mm -hmm. And so it might be very beautiful, mm -hmm. but you might not be able to really appreciate what it means, the different sense of the different whatever. So I think that's where nature and, and coming to ourselves and growing is learning to appreciate either parts of ourselves or other people. And it's when oh, you yeah. get to know someone that you really can appreciate. Uh, so, I mean, it sounds like you're talking about a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think that we're given or <laughs> nature has given us <laughs> um, to have that, that relationship. It's all about that, isn't it? Yeah, I love that. Um, previous place I lived, I lived for nine years and um, without fault, every second week of May, which also happens to be very close to Mother's Day, the Lily of the Valley would pop up. Oh, no. And it was so meaningful to note that that was just part of the rhythm of that place, right? Was that there would be this beautiful little field, whatever, of, of Lily of the Valley, which smells so incredible. Uh, now, before we get to some of our scriptural references, indicating a lot of these emotions and these experiences and these relationships that we all just referenced, I want to share that, you know, getting out into nature as a restorative or awe-inspiring act is not just uh, for people of faith, and it also happens to be pretty hip right now. Um, less than a month ago, mindful.org, right, so mindfulness, uh, actually wrote and posted an article called How to Take an Awe Walk, oh, yeah. and they actually give you, or the reader, steps in how to intentionally get outside and to experience awe and or rest. And later we'll come up with our own, um, you know, methods on how best to do that. I have a few ideas, I'm sure you all do too, but um, this gives six different steps and I can't wait till the end when we kind of figure out what theirs are, what ours are, we can compare and contrast notes. Uh, needless to say, uh, the psalmists also were people who experienced awe and wonder from the bounty and beauty of creation. Uh, I've, I've asked many of you to read uh, sections of scripture. Who has Psalm 8? I do. Joanne, may you please read for us Psalm 8. It's a brief psalm. I think it's only eight or nine verses. But thinking about all of what we just shared and heard both at our tables and collectively, let's now hear how the psalmist interprets awe in nature. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of days and endless. You have founded a bulwark because of your foes, to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human that you are mindful of them or that you care for them? Yet, you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Mm. <coughs> Any quick thoughts, reflections? Wasn't that what one of the astronauts um, quoted in space? Cosmic God. I wonder, did uh, Mars and stuff have trees on it once? Have they discovered that? Or is I have no idea. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Why were we so lucky to get trees and lakes and oceans and mountains and 
fruit's a great question. Yeah. Oh, but, but as Damn. as Joan was reading, the, what stuck out to me, and I guess because of our conversation, is when it says just a little less than God or a little, and I'm thinking mm -hmm. hey, quite a lot. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> humans are really, you know, we think a lot of ourselves. <laughs> And they even say a little less. <laughs> there we well, go. I love the cosmic implication here. That yeah. We have no clue when you look at galaxies in the heavens. I mean, to me, it's just beyond our understanding. Who has Psalm 65? <clears throat> Best. You want it all? Please. <clears throat> Praise is due to you, O God in Zion. And to you shall vows be performed, to you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose to bring near, to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you do answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. And by your strength is you established the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the deep. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain. Your sowing <laughs> furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with riches. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. So clearly, our psalmists also experienced some of what we all have just lifted up awe wonder i really i mean the fact that the psalmist writes that god comes to water that is a relationship and my hope is that when we go out into nature to best experience that to find rest and restoration is that we ultimately are creating a relationship with that space so we've done some Psalms. Now we're going to look at a few Old Testament readings. Uh, I want to ask anyone, who would be the first person I'd think of, or you might think of, that's a biblical character who found himself seeking the solitude of nature, getting away from everyone and the work of what God was telling him to do? Who would be that character? Now I gave you a hint. It's Old Testament. <laughs> oh. But what if I told you that character's name was Jonah? <laughs> now, what do we know a little bit about Jonah? Running away. <laughs> What'd you say? Running away. Running away. Exactly. Uh, from what God wanted Jonah to do, right? And after a couple of reminders, does Jonah finally... <laughs> uh, gentle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Relationally. Right? <laughs> kind of grabbed him by the scruff of the neck there, right? Um, so anyway, Jonah does his whole end of the thing, right? And then who has Jonah chapter 4, verse 5 through 8? Prue, please. Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give him shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. So Jonah goes out into the, into the wilderness, leaves the city, and God creates for Jonah a little space of respite. Going out 
into the wilderness and often falling asleep, finding rest, intentionally taking a break. After trying to find, after a trying time and hoping to find respite is a trope. It's a rhythmic motif for many characters in the Old Testament. Just happened with Jonah. It happens with Jacob. Mm -hmm. That's the context of Jacob's ladder. It happened with Elijah right before Elisha, Elisha, becomes his disciple. And so we see patriarchs, we see psalmists, and we see our prophets all find respite when escaping from the city or when escaping from the routine and finding respite in nature, in the wilderness. Now, Jesus does this too. And the pastoral refrain often said by people in my job is that Jesus would go off alone into the wilderness to pray. And that's not wrong. <laughs> but if we are a people that prays without ceasing, and if some of your own encounters with nature might have been spiritual, it's hard for me not to parse that Jesus's wilderness prayers are also experiences where he was re-energized after a break or after a time of respite in creation. Uh, and I got three examples for us to peruse today. Who has the reading from the fifth chapter of Luke? I do. Can you please give us Luke chapter 15, or excuse me, uh, chapter, it's, it's chapter five, right? Verse 15 through 16. Um, yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret. I got you. Um, oh, 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 I thought you said five. No, okay, so you, chapter five. Okay. Verses 15. 15 16, okay. I'm okay. Sorry. sorry about that. Okay. Sorry. All right. Sorry. Okay. Start over. Okay. But now, more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds were gathering to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. Meanwhile, he would slip away to desert. To desert. Excuse me. To to deserted places and pray. Thank you. Now, may I see it really quick? Sure. Uh, Jesus does this. I'm just going to give us some context. Right after calling the first disciples and before healing a paralytic. Jesus intentionally takes time aside after doing something, doing quite the strenuous task, right? He had to find 12 disciples and then healing a paralytic. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That would be that would be a part of his restoration, his process. Who has uh, Mark chapter one, verse thirty-five through thirty-nine? Yes, please. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone's searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Thank you. And so in these two examples, we have Jesus doing this alone, correct? Jesus going out alone. But in our next example, we have a little different experience of Jesus escaping and finding restoration and rest in nature, not only because he doesn't do it alone, but also because he uses it as a teaching moment. This is Mark 6, uh, following the death of John the Baptist and feeding the 5,000. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourself and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Thank you. So this is after the incredibly unfortunate death of his good friend, his cousin, his mentor, perhaps, John the Baptist. And before one of the most famous miracles, right? The feeding of the 5,000. 
Jesus doesn't only do this himself, but Jesus separates himself from that work, goes out into the wilderness with his closest friends, very reformed concept, right? Doing that in community. And then teaches them to do the same thing. So again, often folks in my line of work say, this is what Jesus did. This is not just what Jesus did. This is what Jesus taught us to do, right? Is to intentionally set aside the time to go out into nature and to take care of ourselves and those that we are in community. Uh, we have, before I go on to some more modern scholars, do we have any thoughts on those? Uh, well, solitude is important even today. That's a huge stress. Solitude, yeah. especially solitude with nature. It's a nice day. <laughs> Not pouring out rain, but gardening yesterday. Biking. Yes. Do you have something you wanted to say? Or are you just playing with the ear? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and the retreats yes. that people go on. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead. Well, I was reading the rest of the Jonah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a fun, fun, funky ending. Yes, it is. And it was, and so God prepared this worm. Yeah. And the worm ate the plant, and Jonah was so upset that he wanted to kill himself. That's that's pretty harsh. <laughs> this is true. There's a whole lot of. Uh, it's not bad in the box. Well, well, well. You know, um, uh, I would argue that. Uh, a repetitive uh, narrative tool in the book of Jonah is to make sure that one listens to what God says to do, right? And then there's a whole lot of examples of God showing Jonah how, Je how Jonah should have just done it. Right? Yeah. So anyway, to your, to your point. God was saying to Jonah, you need to respect nature, respect the environment, Shade of it. I love that interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, author of Last Child in the Woods, Richard Louvre writes, time spent in nature is the most cost-effective and powerful way to counteract the burnout and the sort of depression that we feel when we sit in front of a computer all day. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Henry David Thoreau, uh, a few quotes, an early morning walk is a blessing for the whole day. Heaven is under our feet as well as our heads. And of course, if you split your own firewood, it warms you twice. <laughs> and then Diana Butler Bass, who's very local, right? She's an Anglican theologian who lives here in Alexandria. Uh, in her incredible work, Grounded, cannot recommend it strongly enough. This is a little bit longer quote. Um, but uh, much to my surprise, church has become a spiritual, even a theological struggle for me. I found it increasingly difficult to sing hymns that celebrate a hierarchical heavenly realm or to recite creeds that feel disconnected from life, to pray liturgies that emphasize salvation through blood or to listen to sermons that preach an exclusive way to God to participate in sacraments that exclude others and find myself confined to a hard pew in a building with no windows to the world outside. This has not happened because I am angry at the church or angry at God. Rather, it has happened because I was moving around in the world and began to realize how beautifully God was everywhere. In nature, in my neighborhood, in considering the stars and by seeking my own roots. It took me five decades to figure that out, but I finally understood the church building is not the only sacred space. The world is profoundly sacred as well. And then one final, uh, this is not a modern scholar. This is pretty old. This is Ovid, uh, but this is actually a crop rotation concept, but I think it fits beautifully well with our own souls. And that is to take rest because a field that has rested gives a beautiful crop as we tend our own souls. So uh, in the next 20-ish minutes, um, what are some recommendations that we might all have that we could share with one another for how we could intentionally get outside to intentionally uh, separate our lives, the nonstop, 
and then to get outside to 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 uh, embrace that opportunity to restore our lives and our souls in nature. I have a few ideas, um, and I'll lift them up right now. But I certainly want this to be a communal uh, uh, conversation. And so, one of the first that I want to say, and this is pretty simple, but instead of a coffee break, take twenty minutes and intentionally go outside and go for a walk around the block. That does not take a whole lot of playing. That does not mean you're in Zimbabwe or Glacier, right? But you know, that 2.30 feeling where the, you know, everyone says this is where you need five hour energy. Uh, a, a different way of approaching that, right? Is to intentionally say, I'm going to go outside. Uh, there are some amazing authors that have written about this and I wanna lift up three uh, one is Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of us have heard of Rachel Carson. Uh, Nan Shepard. Anyone heard of Nan Shepard? Nan Shepard is a, um, uh, she actually taught uh, literature at St. Andrews University, where a handful of you will be visiting later uh, this, this spring on the, um, on the Scotland trip. Uh, and she basically would write poetry or essays about walking alone in the hills of Scotland. It's absolutely beautiful writing. She writes about taking her shoes off and feeling the heather underneath her feet. Now that's a mystical experience. Um, she mentions uh, you know, finding a random pool that's not even on the map with a friend and saying, we're gonna swim in this pool. And then just how that is an inspirational, restorative, divine experience. And then Cheryl Strayed, she's a bit more American. Uh, she is who wrote Wild. Um, and there's a movie about, about her experience. Uh, often, many of us uh, think that, you know, going out for a walk, going out for a hike, going out for a bike ride, gardening, whatever that happens to be, when you go outside of nature is not a bad time to be outside, but to also listen to music or to maybe listen to a book on tape or listen to a game. And my recommendation would be to not do that, but would be to intentionally unplug. Uh, then we could have the best opportunity to hear those frogs, right? Then we would not just be in it, but we would be more participatory and more relational. Uh, another thing is to find a spot of land and get to know it. Now that doesn't need to be your land, right? That could be in Dumbarton Oaks. Uh, that could be Mount Vernon, right? That could be the church grounds here. But find a piece of land and get to know it. Find its rhythms, find its patterns, find the routine inhabitants of that land. You're, we're, we're not the only ones on this one, right? Get to know the gophers, get to know the squirrels. <laughs> there is a squirrel on my block that is a black squirrel but has a red tail. There's only one of them. It, exactly, it's kind of fun, right? Yeah. Uh, we want to find a place that we can till. Now I'm using the word till intentionally because that comes from a Hebrew word called shamar. And shamar is the word that we find in Genesis chapter two, verses, uh, verse 15, where the Lord God took the man, settled him in the garden of Eden to shamar it. And that is often interpreted as to farm or to tend or to till, but to shamar it. Now, shamar is an agricultural term that does mean to farm, but also, and I'm quoting from Brigitte Call, Union Theological Seminary professor, where I went, she's amazing, writes that when it's not used agriculturally, it's also translated into English as to serve. A meeting that provides an important clue to understanding the connotation of the word's deeper meaning and a relationship that we have with creation. Humanity receives its original definition as servant of the earth, being in a clearly dependent and subordinate position. Now, one example of when shamar is used is, yes, this Genesis 2, 15 section, but shamar is also the same verb used in Joshua 24, verse 15, 
But as for me and my family, I will shamar the Lord. Till. Checked. Shamar is also found in the first sentence of the famous blessing found in the book of Numbers. The Lord bless and shamar you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and grant you peace. Uh, as Klaus Westerman describes this relationship, what's decisive is the responsibility of humanity for the preservation of what has been entrusted to us. We need to shamar. Any questions about shamar? Uh, another recommendation that I have is to balance the solo and the communal. You know, and I think Jesus actually does that pretty well, especially in that third section is that we often think of Jesus going off alone to pray. I mean, that certainly happens in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? But does Jesus really want that to happen on the very last night of his life? He asks everyone to stay up, right? He goes to this beautiful location. He wants to be there with his closest friends and colleagues. And they fall asleep. And then... To strive to create a relationship with nature because then even when we are out there solo, it's a communal restorative process. Uh, any others before I now share what mindful.org has to say? Yes. Well, I would say that not to be discouraged if you're in a situation like in a hospital bed or whatever, where you cannot go out in nature because yeah. to assume that nature is only out there. Yeah. But there is something about the movement of air. So maybe an open window and closed eyes um, can transport you. And I know that sometimes in a setting when we're, we're asked, you're trying to calm down, they'll you know, we'll be asked to close our eyes and to picture ourselves in a place that we have had as these experiences that we talked about so that we can recall. Them. So I would say that to have, first of all, the internal sense of what it is that we're, uh, to have a sense of, 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 of the Lord or to have, to be first get the verses or the whatever that we're then wanting to reconnect with mm -hmm. that um, we then have that rich foundation that we can take and find or express in other settings. Sure. But I think we have to be able to realize that nature is not just out there. Love that. Or the best and then maybe a follow up on that um, that is just occurring to me. I would love if one of you know if anybody's ever researched the history of sending flowers. You know, people just say, well, I don't want flowers, in lieu of flowers, whatever. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but flowers, why do we feel we need to do that when somebody's at the hospital, when somebody's a shut in at home? We make it a point. I don't know what happens here, but other places I've been, they've taken apart the flowers from the sanctuary right. and taken the shut ins. Yeah. Does that happen here? Yeah. Um, th there's a reason. And I think it's a way of bringing a touch of nature, a touch of the beauty that God has created into places that can be dark and dismal and grief stricken. We have, we have, we lost a friend recently, and his widow kept saying, I just hope people don't send tons of flowers. I don't want to have to deal with flowers. And I thought, oh my word, where is, you know, let's talk about this later. Uh, <laughs> Just that sharing of nature. Yeah. Well, and 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 I allow me now to respond to that by sharing us an example of when a dear friend actually gave me a gift of a plant that was not during a sad time, and now that plant is in my kitchen and it sits right by my kitchen table, and I then not only think of that plant but I also think of that person every time you know I have breakfast, which adds to the relational aspect. You know, uh, Emily, and then there are a couple of thoughts because I'm 
I'm one of the people who's tethered into their computer all day with work. Yeah. Um, so I actually move, I have a desk outside. <laughs> so when I'm between phone calls or for meeting it's early, I'm I'm already in, I'm not having to physically move. So I can sit and yeah. watch the psychotic chipmunks that I have now discovered <laughs> run in like Mach 20 across one little square of grass that's about the size of one of these tables. So it was kind of nice to already be in nature. So yeah. when I had two minutes between phone calls, I was already in a place where I could stop. Um, we also gave my mother-in-law a digital picture frame and we can upload photos. We gave the link out to everyone in the family. So when she's um, she's just not as mobile when she's sitting in her chair, big pictures, and I always send pictures of nature so that she'll have visuals of being outside while she's inside. So kind of using technology to bring it into where you are if you can't go out. And then um, two last things is I think it's fun just to lay in because we talk about walking and participating in it. But it's also pretty cool to just lay in a field of grass or sit under the stars. So to truly be at one and not in motion, I think oh, yeah. is really, it, and you, know, you can always kind of find a little square of grass or a tree to lean against and just be still with, within it. Mm -hmm. And then the last, I did a, a mindful class with mindful walking. And he was like, don't put on your earphones. Don't do this. Don't do this. And I was like, oh, and at first I was like, ew, like what? <laughs> um, but he helped us get more intentional. So it wasn't just absent-minded walking. Mm -hmm. It was see how many flowers you can, or how many colors do you count on your walk? Or how many times do you see a bird? So it wasn't just walking without, it was intentional within. So um, it kind of helped me make the transition walking without distraction was to, to kind of seek. Love that. Thank you. Just uh, along the lines of what you were saying, two things came to mind, and I went to architecture school, Virginia Tech, and did a whole report on water and architecture. And in Islam, the water is very gentle; it's very quiet. In Western architecture, it's more like a big fountain. <laughs> um, but but they both have meaning, like yeah. spiritual meaning. So that you know, in, in Islam, there's usually an interior courtyard so it, it it's been going on in architecture in you know for millennia and then the second thing is um artists like the hudson river school they recognize that there is something spiritual about nature and they, they would do these large landscapes um and rent, i guess um, other times that i can't think of the exact time but Artists before the Renaissance would do nature settings um, based on an understanding of what they thought like a lion was, having never seen a lion, but they just brought art and nature to people who didn't have that exposure. And then actually a third thing, plants in the house have been shown to um, clean the air. It makes you feel better. You, you are physically healthier. And I think that's part of bringing plants to people who are sick. And maybe, it, you know, one plant can't make somebody's cancer go away, but it, it can make some, there's some benefit, benefit to have. Yeah, I mean, the, the relationship mm -hmm. that every single scriptural author had with nature creation uh, was so much different than ours because they lived closer to the earth. They live closer to their food sources. They live closer to their water sources than we do. Uh, and so when we sort of put our mind into that, thinking about just what one plant does is really powerful. Uh, Prue, and then Dan. Uh, another thing, when you're older or like me, and just horrible walker, you can't really you can take a half hour walk or two or work for pleasure. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can still enjoy nature. One time I was at Fort Worth Park, and uh, I sat in a bench and watched the people walk by, the dogs, uh, the nature all around. And I did read a book, though, but then I looked up in the book. So I think reading a book in nature is important. Just quick, too. Isn't, isn't uh, I'm, I'm not a painter, en plan painting? 
or what's that? Uh, I'm I'm saying saying. Thank you, right? I mean, that's, that's, that, I mean. And also, sitting on the balcony in the spring when it's 70 degrees and the geranium plants are blooming when you yeah. put out there. And that's nice, too. Absolutely. Well, just take off on the water. Yeah. I think one of the, the, uh, Living around here, we get to go to all the memorials and monuments and so forth. And going to the FDR, where water plays such mm. an important part and different, you know, he had such a long presidency. And, you know, whether it's war or brokenness or whatever, and how they, the water in the sculptures has played the part to have us understand the different times of his presidency. It's amazing mm -hmm. but how sound is is given to us uh and mm. uh so he, he, I'm, I'm just as an example right um how many of us think that going to the cherry blossom festival at two o'clock on a saturday <laughs> in a few weeks will be a great time <laughs> But how many of us think that going to the Cherry Blossom Festival at maybe 7 a.m., 8.30 a.m. on a Tuesday <laughs> would be a pretty great time? Yeah. 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 No, I, 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 have, uh, I have three different uh, close family groups coming this year because it's the first time I lived here where it's not pandemic <laughs> to see that. And it's and just, you know, we're trying to time when it will be the least Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but but it's a it's a close by experience that yeah. that you know I think we all can resonate with. Yes. Yeah. So I just have one collectively. Everybody is sharing their experiences. We love to look at the stars and the heavens, especially up north where we live in the summertime, where we see the sky and so forth. But right now, we noticed last night. Right now in the heavens, it's the only time there's two planets in the line in the vertical line that you can look at. And it's sort of all looking at it saying, how is this happening? Yeah. Yeah. Two brilliant stars are in a line that everybody can see tonight if you can find some message in the dark. We experience that. It's really about six or seven o'clock, and, and then you keep saying, or you can see the steeple in the church in and the two stars off to the left of That'd be great. The best time. True. I like that artistic idea. Uh, anything else before I uh, close us with prayer? Right. Yes, please. Well, people look and people then don't look. And people see and then people don't see. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a fly fisherman, and fly fishing mm -hmm. is a very visual sport. Mm -hmm. You don't fish at the water at all. You fish at the fish you're looking at. You're trying to put a little tiny fly by the mouth of the fish. That's what you're trying to do. So it's very intense. Now, Gail Zangine used to always like to go with me when I go fly fishing. And she was pretty eccentric, so I tolerated that. <laughs> and I always wondered why she wanted to go when I went fly fishing. And one day I said to her, Aunt Jean, why do you always come with me when I go fly fishing? And she will arrange it so we can have a day together when we're in Oregon. If we're in Baltimore, you want to have an afternoon with me the whole day fishing? And she said, because fishermen know where to look to see beauty. And I'd never thought about that before, ever. Right, yeah. And I said, well, today I was going to go with a snow goose. Oh, I love snow geese. And I said, well, they usually come to this spot this time of year. And so we go to this lake, which is very near Red River, and we're there. And the snow geese were just something that the back of my brain knew was there. And all of a sudden, the snow geese came. And the lake was considerably bigger than this room, maybe four times the size of it, at the irregular shape. And within about four minutes, it was lined totally. There was no water visible. <laughs> Solid snowbirds, wow. snow geese. And wow. snow geese is a big pool. <laughs> and Aunt Jean was on the other side of the lake just beaming. At <laughs> and she's going like this. And I'm going like that. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to try to cast with all those. <laughs> right. Hey, my first one. 
or it might hurt me. But also they were just so many. And neither one of us could count how many words to say. But it's been amazing. And after that, it changed my reactions when I go fishing. Because you know, there's a whole series of lakes and streams I fish. And now, you know, I found that I've learned a lot about what a lot of the fishermen I am. <laughs> because I'll go to the Susquehanna River, which is a big river by the biggest dam east of the Mississippi. And we were down below the dam fishing fairly rapid water, trying not to fall and break your neck. And I'm working very, very hard because there's five or six good sized trout right there. And they're within the length of my fly rod. And I could actually do what's called bat look, which is where you use your fly rod and kind of dangle it and dance the fly on the water, which is a real fun kind of fishing and puts your reef up. Anyway, and I'm all excited and I'm trying to dapple for these fish. And I realized that they're probably about eight inches further than I can reach. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to catch a fish there. <laughs> but the next thing I hear is kind of a clunking noise. And now right next to me, within four feet, is a great blue heron. Mm -hmm. Now, the great blue heron really isn't blue. It's pretty white. But it's a big, big bird. As tall as I am. And it's there, and it's four feet from me, standing in the water, the same part, distance from the shore I am. And it's watching me like, okay, <laughs> so show me how to fish. <laughs> and I just put down my rod, and I went like that. <laughs> and the heron goes like this. <laughs> and he had a fish and swallowed it. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. So he looked at me like, all right, show me. So nature's teaching you. So what happened was I watched that hearing catch it like six fish. Mm -hmm. I spent another hour in touch with it. <laughs> now, could I say there were no fish there? No. <laughs> no fish couldn't be caught yet. What could I say? Heron a lot of fish. That's great. I have three books I'll recommend that I really enjoy uh, that sort of get to this, uh, this restorative aspect of getting out into nature. Um, one is a book by Diana Butler Bass, who I quoted earlier, called Grounded. One is called Braiding Sweetgrass yeah. by Robin Wall Kimmer. Um, and the third is by Ernest Hemingway, and it's about fly fishing, and it's called Big Two-Hearted River. All three of these books are available at Arlington and Alexandria's Library, and they are also available on audio. Big Two Hearted River. Oh, it's great stuff. I'm sure you have. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you great thanks for your love, uh, for the way that you keep us in relationship, and for the way that uh, we continue lifelong to learn more about you and the way that you reveal yourself to us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone.